This is chapter 11, and it's entitled Her Family and Her Work. Just a minute, turning down the music just a little bit. There we go. Everyone knows it is a matter of time until there is a world war too. The League of Nations is crippled when the United States refuses to join and Germany is being forced to pay exorbitant reparations. Einstein signs a petition that will outlaw war. Marie declines to sign with this explanation and she says, I entirely share your aspirations for the reign of peace and fraternity. Certainly, I have a horror of war and I deplore, like you, the subjection of intelligence to brute force. But the highest cultivation of intellect is not a guarantee of a just view of national and social problems." End quote. Marie is busy with the laboratory. She writes the book Radiology in War. Like millions of others, Marie wants to put the war years behind her. Her willingness does not include an immediate change of heart, though, toward the Germans, and particularly the scientists who gave them support. During the war, a group of 93 intellectuals had signed a manifesto entitled Appeal to the Cultured World, and that supported the German excuse of invading neutral Belgium as a military necessity. Among the 93 intellectuals, hence the name, the Manifesto of the 93, who had signed our 15 scientists and Marie despises them. After the war, when Marie meets a foreign scientist, she asks them if they had signed the appeal. If they did sign, Marie barely speaks to them and she will not have them work in her laboratory. Marie returns to her research and she hasn't lost her touch. An assistant gives this description of Marie working <clears throat> and says, The series of operations, opening the apparatus, starting the chronometer, lifting the weight, etc., was affected by Madame Curie with the, the admirable discipline and harmony of movement. No pianist could accomplish what Madame Curie's hands accomplished with greater virtuosity. It was a perfect technique which tended to reduce the coefficient of personal error to zero. End quote. Marie might be thinking the rest of her days will be spent in the solitude of her new laboratory. Marie might also think the last person on earth she will talk to, let alone trust, is a journalist. Changes are coming. For a scientist of her stature, Marie has no secretary, and the typewriter she uses is the one she bought from a war surplus sale. The Curie Institute, Marie's new laboratory, should be equipped with modern apparatus, but suffers for lack of funds. Monetary donations are given to the medical research side of the Institute, not Marie's science side. There is also a shortage of radium. Marie and her team continue to make do with her original small sample. A suggestion is made that Marie make a public appeal to raise funds. Considering the media circus portraying Marie as an assistant or a husband-stealing foreigner, she says no. Any requests for media interviews are on Marie's terms. She gives interviews only on Tuesdays and Fridays, and the guidelines for these conversations are very specific. Questions are for scientific matters, nothing personal. Into this arena steps Marie Mattingly Melanie, who everyone calls Missy. She will earn the love and trust of Marie Curie. As an aside, Missy earns the admiration of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, and Eleanor describes Missy as, quote, fine lace made of cable wire, end quote. Back to the text. Born in Kentucky, Missy's mother is a progressive college graduate who challenges the status quo by establishing a school for freed black slaves in 1876. Missy's plans to become a concert pianist are thrown off when a horseback riding accident leaves her with a limp, 
and then she gets a diagnosis of having a bad lung. Missy claims, quote, I have been lame since 15 and had a bad lung since 17 and have done the work of three men ever since. At 17, Missy is a full-time reporter for the Washington Post. She becomes the Denver Post's bureau chief in Washington, D.C., and she is the first woman to have a seat in the Senate Press Gallery. By the time she is meeting Marie, she is a well-known American journalist and editor of the Delineator, which is a popular women's magazine. Long before Barbara Walters, Missy will have a list of famous interviews, Hitler, Mussolini, H.G. Wells, and Eleanor Roosevelt. Missy's earned reputation comes from her commitment to inform her readers of current events and make them aware of their civic duties to their country. After the ravages of World War I, getting her readers to care when what they really want to do is pull back and take a break, it is a difficult goal. Missy is searching for the next great story for her readers. A hint of the story is the fact that cancer has surpassed tuberculosis as the chief cause of death. Missy will soon have her aha moment for a story. But first, she is walking in to meet Madame Curie. Missy has been requesting an interview with Marie, and the request is always denied. Missy tries using her influence with the editor of a French magazine, but Missy is told, quote, she will see no one, she does nothing but work. Few things in life are more distasteful to her than publicity. Her mind is as exact and logical as science itself. There are two things for her, her family and her work, end quote. Using the power of networking, Missy contacts her friend, Henri Pierre Roches. Roches is a Paris Society art collector and he is friends with Marie, which is through a mutual visit uh, when they both have met at the French sculptor Rodin, um, Auguste Rodin. <clears throat> Missy asks Roches to speak with Marie. He agrees uh, and assaging Concerns for being misrepresented, he suggests to Marie she meet with this American journalist. And Marie agrees. Missy records her thoughts prior to meeting Marie. Quote, I had been in Mr. Edison's laboratory a few weeks before sailing from home. Edison is rich in material things, as he should be. Every kind of equipment <clears throat> is at his command. He is a power in the financial as well as scientific world. In my childhood, I had lived near Alexander Graham Bell, had admired his great house and his fine horse. A short time before, I had been in Pittsburgh, where the sky is plumed by the tall smokestacks of the greatest radium reduction plants in the world. I remembered that millions of dollars had been spent on radium watches and radium gun sites. Several millions of dollars worth of radium was even then stored in various parts of the United States. I had been prepared to meet a woman of the world, enriched by her own efforts, and established in one of the white palaces along the Champs de Elysees or some other beautiful boulevard of Paris. End quote. And instead, Missy records Marie's office. Quote, the small, bare office, which might have been furnished from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I found a simple woman working in an inadequate laboratory and living in an inexpensive apartment on the meager pay of a French professor. Missy remembers the door opened and I saw a pale, timid little woman in a black cotton dress with the saddest face I had ever looked upon. Her kind, patient, beautiful face had the detached expression of a scholar. Suddenly, I felt like an intruder." End quote. On that day in May, 1920, a friendship began. Marie explains to Missy, her difficulties in expanding her research when she only has one gram of radium. Missy is astonished and responds, 
You have only one gram? Marie corrects her and replies, I? Oh, I have none. It belongs to the laboratory. As their conversation continues, Missy realizes that Marie knows the location of every gram of radium in the world. Marie tells Missy, America has about 50 grams of radium. Four of these are in Baltimore, six in Denver, seven in New York, and on it goes. Missy suggests Marie use the money from her patents to buy the radium she needs, and Marie replies, quote, There were no patents. We were working in the interests of science. Radium was not to enrich anyone. Radium is an element. It belongs to all people. Missy goes on, But you ought to have all the resources in the world to continue your research. Someone must undertake this. Marie responds, Who? Missy ends the interview with this last question. If you could have one wish, what would you most want in the world? Marie has an immediate answer, and she replies, a gram of radium. Missy, with a core goal of improving the life of mankind through civil service, has just found an icon. Marie with a core goal of improving the life of mankind through research, has just found a supporter. Missy is going to make Marie's wish come true. In the following days, the two women meet several times. Missy is proposing she will raise $100,000, which today's in today's money <clears throat> would be around $1.5 million. She'll raise the money in America to buy one gram of radium. The plan includes having Marie come to America to be given her gram of radium by the president. The rest of the arrangement is an autobiography to be written with the royalties going to Marie to help her finances. For Missy, the publishers of her magazine will have exclusive rights to the first articles of Marie's trip to America. Marie worries about media attention. She does not want the American press to make this a rehash of the Langevin affair. Missy, using her connections, contacts every editor-in-chief of every newspaper she knows and asks them to bury the old story. Missy is so effective, not only do they comply with her request, but some newspapers give donations for the radium cause. Missy begins her work on finding the right hook for her story. Using the American love of an underdog, the headlines for the fundraising cam campaign will read, quote, that millions shall not die. The emphasis will be on what is hitting home for so many Americans, cancer. Missy puts the emphasis on Marie's work in support of cancer treatment. For in truth, radium therapy is made possible due to Marie's research. The pitch in the campaign reads, quote, the great Curie is getting older and the world and the world losing God alone knows what great secret, and millions are dying of cancer every year. Marie and then Marie goes on, no, I'm sorry, Missy goes on and reminds her readers that Marie Curie, quote, has contributed to the progress of science and the relief of human suffering, and yet in the prime of her life she is without tools which would enable her to make further contribution of her genius, end quote. Marie is beginning to comprehend that the prestige of her name and her presence, going to America, will help garner support for research and laboratories. As for an autobiography about her life, Marie doubts it will be of interest. And she tells Missy, But it will not be much of a book. It is such an uneventful, simple little story. I was born in Warsaw of a family of teachers. I married Pierre Curie and I had two children. I have done my work in France, end quote. Missy's all-women organizing committee is a progressive mark for the day. However, progress only goes so far when committee members' names are listed in the traditional style of the time of using their husband's first name, not their own. The committee includes Mrs. John D. Rockefeller, and he was the oil baron and obviously her husband, Mrs. Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge is the vice president and the founder of the American Society for the Control of Cancer, Mrs. Robert Mead. 
With Missy's return to the States, telegrams are clicking back and forth across the Atlantic as details continue to be hammered out. I think today that would be like having text messages. <laughs> In order to ensure privacy, Missy and Marie have developed code words for different topics, the Langevin affair being one of these topics. Missy's telegram address in New York is Idealism, and she is living up to that name. Some details being cleared up are hilarious. Missy, in her telegram, uses the term grain or slash gram for the amount of radium. <clears throat> Marie wants to clarify this and tells and telegrams, quote, Grain insufficient to justify absence uh, from laboratory because equal to 15th of gram. <laughs> so, I think that's so funny. <laughs> when the Paris papers get wind of the story of the gram of radium, they announce that the United States is giving the gram to the University of Paris, the Sorbonne. Marie is furious. What might be perceived as a control issue would be accurate. She wants control of the radium. For her own self? Hardly. If she had wanted to be greedy, she could have started that a long time ago. Missy writes and confirms to Marie, quote, The gram of radium is for you, for your personal use, and you will be the one to decide how to use it after your death. And then she adds, I would be happy to be of some use to the University of Paris if it needs help, but for the moment I am devoting all my time and energy to your interests." End quote. With a lack of donations from big donors, Missy switches gears and goes to a grassroots effort. What today is called crowdsourcing, Missy is requesting one or five dollar donations from all of her readers. The cause catches on with college women who start support campaigns to raise money. A member of the Marie Curie Radium Fund writes, We witness in her, research, in her research one of the most complete pieces of detective work that ever unearthed a hidden mystery. It is the privilege of the women of this country to lay this tribute at her feet, a gift of radium instead of a wreath or a laurel, with which she can and will give back to them a thousandfold more in value a hoped-for revelation of the medical power when, it forces, when its forces can be tamed and used in cancer, that dreaded scourge. The itinerary for the trip to America is shaping up, and it includes 18 college lectures, 7 honorary degrees. There will be a tour of Niagara Falls and the Grand Canyon. Around these dates are sprinkled luncheons and dinners, the main event is at the steps of the White House. President Harding will be awarding Marie one gram of radium. Marie tells Missy she can only stay for two weeks, explaining she will miss her daughters too much. Missy immediately tells Marie to bring the girls. Eve takes Marie shopping for the upcoming dress, a trip. Her new dresses are still black, but at least Eve convinces her mother to leave the worn dress at home. The date is set for boarding the ship on May 7, 1921. In March, a French journalist is startled when his receptionist tells him he has a call from Madame Curie and she wishes to speak to you. Good grief, what on earth could this be? The last time he heard, from, heard Madame Curie's voice was in November of 1906, her first day teaching at the Sorbonne. The editor remembers the call and says, This great woman, the greatest woman in France, was speaking haltingly, tremblingly, and almost like a little girl. She, who handles daily a particle of radium more dangerous than lightning, was afraid when confronted by the necessity of appearing before the public. <clears throat> and Marie is telling him, I wanted to tell you that I am going to America. It was very hard for me to decide to go because America is so far and so big. If someone did not come for me, I should probably never have made the trip. I should have been too frightened. But to this fear is added a great joy. I've devoted my life to the science of radioactivity, and I know 
all we owe to America in this field of science. I am told you are among those who strongly favor this distant trip, so I wanted to tell you I have decided to go. But please, don't let anyone know about it. End quote. <clears throat> France is caught off guard with the clamor for Marie's attention from the United States and that the president will be the one to give Marie the gift of radium. Begrudging financial support for the laboratory finally comes through. However, Marie still doesn't have a secretary. The French Minister of Public Education offers Marie the Legion of Honor for the second time. For the second time, Marie declines. The French offer to have a bon, bon voyage party at the Paris Opera. Marie agrees when she knows the money raised by the event will benefit the Radium Institute. Missy is back in Paris for the gala. There is an irony in this evening when ten years earlier Marie was roasted in the press. Jean Perrin, who had come to her defense during the dark times, is a speaker for the gala. He extols to the audience Marie's great contributions to science. The day to set sail on the Olympic is nearing. Marie is 54 years old. Eve and Irene have always known their mother as a scientist, but they have no idea their mother is so famous. They are beginning to understand. The president of the White Star Line escorts Marie and her daughters to their rooms, the honeymoon suite. Marie does not bask in this lap of luxury. She is uncomfortable. She writes a friend, quote, I left France to go on this distant frolic, so little to my taste and habits. End quote. Marie added about Missy that she is, is more of a friend than I can tell you, and I don't think she's doing this for personal advantage. She is an idealist and seems very disinterested. End quote. Aside from the uncertainties and no staff that is overseeing the details, Marie is also struggling with a constant humming in her ear, tinnitus, and her vision is becoming cloudier. Marie has double cataracts. Missy has arranged for an eye specialist to see Marie once they arrive in the States. The voyage is rough and causes Marie dizzy spells. When the ship docks in New York City, Marie is deluged with reporters and photographers who meet her on the upper deck. Marie thought she could hand the reporters a typed statement that she has written. Clearly, they wanted more. Seeing Marie will be interviewed before she gets off the ship, someone brings her a chair. Questions come from all sides and voices call out to her, Look this way, Madame Curie. Both Marie and Irene, dressed in plain clothes and sensible shoes, aren't exactly camera ready. It is Eve, in her silk stockings and high-heeled shoes, and a flowered hat that catches the photographers, and the reporters dub her Miss Radium Eyes. Thousands have gathered to welcome Marie. A band is playing the anthem of France, the United States, and Poland. In the crowds are Girl Scouts, nurses, doctors, college students, each with their own connection to this iconic woman, a scientist, a teacher. Groups of Polish immigrants have come waving their national flag. Eve and Irene are astonished at the attention. Marie is overwhelmed. She is handed bouquets of flowers and stays to hear several speeches. They are finally able to leave in a limousine, which has been made available compliments of Mrs. Andrew Carnegie. When the car arrives at Missy's home, Marie sees the pathway to the house is lined with roses. This expression of gratitude is from a horticulturist who had been cured of cancer by radium treatments. So many Americans truly wanted to show their love and appreciation to the famous Madame Curie. They admire her for her integrity to not have made financial gain and to serve mankind. There are also those who are curious to see a woman scientist. Marie will never grow accustomed to this, accustomed to this attention. On a later trip, Marie writes to Eve and says, I am seeking, however, to surmount my extreme repulsion for this whole situation and keep my eyes on the real issue, which is to gather the necessary funds to allow me to pursue my work. End quote. 
Marie makes a constant effort to escape the press, and she writes, <clears throat> I came down the service stairs to avoid 60 reporters waiting at the main entrance. Marie is cautious to never give advice in any correspondence or interview. Just as Einstein would not suggest how to run an electrical wire in a house, Marie will continually remind anyone that she cannot give advice on medical treatments for cancer. Marie talks to crowds of her role in science and tries to keep the focus on the benefits of pure research. And she says, when radium was discovered, no one knew that it would prove useful in hospitals. The work was one of pure science. And this is a proof that scientific work must not be considered from the point of view of the direct usefulness of it. It must be done for itself, for the beauty of science, and then there is always the chance that a scientific discovery may become, like radium, a benefit to humanity. In spite of her efforts, exaggerated claims continue. Headlines from the New York Times declare, Madame Curie plans to end all cancer. Or there is the triple alliteration that is always a catchy phrase, but it's a false cry when the headline is Curie cures cancer. Eve later writes about the trip, quote, Americans had surrounded Madame Curie with an almost religious devotion and had placed her in the first rank of living men and women. End quote. Aside from outrageous medical claims, the press is handling Marie better than in the past. The New York Times reports she, that's my dog snoring again. <laughs> the New York Times reports, quote, she works for science, not for money. And it might be said with truth that she will be the trustee rather than the owner of this American gift. A small hiccup at the beginning of the trip is Marie not having a cap and gown. Since she is the only woman on the faculty of the Sorbonne, the men have gowns, she doesn't. Missy calls in a tailor, to quickly make a cap and gown for Marie. No one argues with Marie, though, when she refuses to wear the mortarboard cap, saying it looks hideous and it keeps falling off. The teas and ceremonies are unavoidable. What Marie enjoys most, though, is her time spent meeting women students in their labs and discussing their work. The tour of schools includes Smith, Simmons, Wellesley, Wellesley Radcliffe, Bryn Mawr, all women's colleges. At the Smith College, she thanks them for the beautiful reception. In the remarks made by Professor Nielsen, Marie is described as, quote, first among women of all ages, end quote. Those are nice words, except Nielsen goes on to tell this story. He relays that Marie is so engrossed in her lab at one time that when a maid comes in crying, saying she has swallowed a pin, and the story goes on that Marie replies, saying, Never mind, here's another. End quote. When it's Marie's turn at the podium, she answers, It's a good story, but unfortunately, it never happened. Events are scheduled at the Waldorf Astoria, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Museum of National Natural History. One memorable event is May 18th at Carnegie Hall, the International Federation of University Women has 3,500 members gathered to honor Marie. The ceremony includes the French and Polish ambassadors. Marie is thrilled to see her old friend, pianist, and former Polish Prime Minister, you remember? <laughs> Ignacy Paderewski. <laughs> That's just so wonderful how they keep bumping into each other. The media attention, the constant stares and shaking of hands, though, are exhausting to Marie. One man shakes Marie's hand so hard, he sprains her wrist. Now her arm is in a sling. On the eve of the White House ceremony, Missy shows Marie the document she will receive the next day. Marie looks over the paper and says, We have to add something. Marie wants the wording to explicitly state not only her ownership of the radium, but that it will be her decision on how to leave the radium in her will. Marie wants to ensure that when she dies, the gram of radium will be the property of the Curie Laboratory. Missy agrees and says they will have the wording checked by a lawyer. 
Marie wants it done now. Missy explains to Marie this means having the donors agree. Miss Marie says, fine, have the donors agree now. A lawyer is found to make the change that night, and two of the women are contacted to represent the donors. Marie explains to Missy, the act of the gift will soon be valid, and I may die in a few hours. Marie also wants the money being donated to come under her control and not answer to the donors. Marie holds to this in spite of the money being tied up for several years in a bank. Marie does not chance having to bow to whims of donors when it comes to spending the money for the laboratory. May 20th, 1921. Marie is walking down the White House steps on the arm of President Warren Harding. His remarks for the occasion extol Marie as the, quote, soul of radium and a, quote, noble woman, devoted wife, a loving mother who, along with her crushing work, performed all the duties a woman must perform, end quote. President Harding places a ribbon around Marie's neck with a gold key hanging from it. The key is for the small mahogany box on the table serving as a decoy for the actual box that is being guarded. Harding declares, quote, As a nation whose womanhood has been exalted to fullest participation in citizenship, we are proud to honor in you a woman whose work has earned universal acclaim and attested women's equality in every intellectual and spiritual activity, end quote. Finally, Marie will have access to another gram of radium. The radium, less than half a teaspoon, is divided into a dozen different portions in sealed glass vials and then secured in a lead case with a wall two inches thick. The casket is on display at the Curie Museum in Paris. It weighs 130 pounds, <clears throat> 60, which is 60,000 times the weight of the radium itself. <laughs> at the White House reception, Irene and Eve are in line shaking hands and greeting guests in English, French, or Polish. Marie is wearing the same black dress that she wore 10 years ago for her second Nobel Prize. Another stop on the Curie tour is the Cannonsburg Company in Pennsylvania. This is the facility that prepared the gram of radium for Marie. They used the same process that Marie used, except she did this in a shack for a laboratory. Marie is unable to keep up with the schedule of events. She is suffering with hypertension and a kidney infection. Missy is also exhausted and near the point of collapse. Keeping up with the relentless schedule has caused Missy's tuberculosis to reoccur. Marie sends her daughters to represent her at ceremonies. There are some events where the daughters literally stand in for Marie, wearing the honorary cap and gown to receive the honorary degree. No one ever knows. Irene is bored and finds this a trying time. Eve comes through as the needed balance since she enjoys the social chatter about jazz and fashion. As Irene settles into her role at events, she is the one to talk with the scientists. In Chicago, there are large groups of Polish women and men gathered to see Marie. These touching occasions are also meaningful to Marie. The women simply want to be near Marie. Marie is the woman who represents their beloved country. They reach out to kiss her hands and touch her dress. In the midst of the celebrity attention, Marie is still unassuming and takes care of her own needs. Missy writes about Marie, quote, Once during our American travels, we stayed in a home where there were several other house guests besides our party of five. I entered Madame Curie's room and I found her washing her underclothes. Marie explained, it's nothing at all. I know perfectly well how to do it. And with all these extra guests in the house, the servants have enough to do. End quote. Lavish and luxurious will never, will not ever be descriptions for Marie. When Marie sees a small house with a garden from the train window, she says, I've always wanted such a little home. While many colleges are lining up to give honorary degrees to Marie, some schools resent that Marie is taking from their rice bowl. 
They want to protect their private funds and not give their donors any reason to divert money to Marie. Marie receiving a generous donation from Andrew Carnegie being an example. There is also backdoor politics for not honoring Marie. At Yale University, Boltwood has pressured the school to not grant Marie a degree. Marie is in good company because Boltwood also blocked Einstein from receiving an honorary degree. Misogyny and anti-Semitism isn't erased with academic intelligence. Boltwood later meets with Marie at the famous Sloan Laboratory for Yale. After spending a couple hours with Marie, he describes her as touching and unusually, unusually amiable. He has the delayed epiphany of, quote, her great interest in scientific subjects, end quote. Harvard's current president will compare Marie to Sir Isaac Newton, except the retired president, Charles Elliott, thinks differently. Charles refuses to meet Marie at a formal reception held in her honor, and he writes, The credit for the discovery of radium did not entirely belong to her, and that, furthermore, she had done nothing of great importance since her husband died in 1906. End quote. Marie joins the girls for the train trip across the United States to see the Grand Canyon. This is a memorable time for Marie and her daughters. As they visit the National Park, could Marie have imagined that the Marie Curie Cancer Care, which is a United Kingdom charity established in 1948, that they would have a yearly fundraiser track, trek in the canyon to raise money to provide care for people with cancer and support their families. And to my knowledge, that's a, still a charity to date. The day arrives when the Curie ladies must leave the United States. This trip will redefine the rest of Marie's life. Whether she wants it or not, she is a celebrity. Irene and Eve must share their sweet May with the world. Her cabin is filled with flowers and telegrams of well-wishers. Saying goodbye to Missy, though, is the most difficult. Marie tells her, look me, Let me look at you one more time, my dear, dear friend. This may be the last time I will ever see you. Marie has found a kindred spirit who has survived in a world dominated by men, and they both are struggling with the frustrations of poor health. Missy has tuberculosis, and Marie is sure she herself is going blind. Both women also share a trait of remaining disinterested in any personal gain from their chosen profession. The next 15 years will include a continuous flow of correspondence, Honest and revealing, Marie later writes to Missy, asking her to destroy their letters. And Marie explains, They are part of me, and you know how reserved I am in my feelings. End quote. More so, Marie knows how poorly the world tries to understand her. July 2nd, 1921, their ship arrives in France. There are no throngs of adoration at the dock, only two reporters. Two lab assistants have come to help with the luggage and to take the radium to the lab. The media preoccupation is with the, the French-American boxing match between Carpentier and Dempsey. Reporters ask Marie her opinion of the fight, and she responds that she has no opinion in this matter. Marie and the girls are not able to even get a ride. All the cabs are all parked near loudspeakers that are broadcasting the fight. The Curie ladies walk home. After the, fir <laughs> After the public fuss in the States, this might have been a relief. Marie brings back from this trip the gram of radium worth $100,000, equipment given to her from the Sloan Laboratory, <clears throat> $22,000 worth of mesothorium, $7,000 in speaker's fees, and an extra $52,000 that Marie has, uh, that Missy has raised. Marie has promised to write a biography of Pierre Curie, and that earns $50,000. Marie writes a thank you to her American women for their gifts, and she says, I was very thankful to my sisters of America for this genuine proof of their affection, end quote. What Marie also 
takes home is a satisfaction in seeing the number of scientific laboratories and hospitals using Curie therapy. It is more than she could have imagined for France. Maria is exhausted and takes a vacation to rest. Swim in the ocean, read, and putter in the garden. The village on the French coast has become so popular for the yearly gathering of science family. <laughs> it has been dubbed the Sorbonne by the Sea. The Curie family friends are there, the Borels, the Perrins, Eve and Irene are with Marie, and for a time Marie can relax and enjoy just being a mother. <clears throat> Eve's relationship with her mother has always been different from Irene's, and Eve writes, quote, My mother was 37 years old when I was born. When I was big enough to know her well, she was already an aging woman who had passed the summit of renown. And yet it is the celebrated scientist who is strangest to me, probably because the idea that she was a celebrated scientist did not occupy the mind of Marie Curie, end quote. Through Eve's childhood, Marie recognizes Eve's talent. She writes that Eve has astonishing musical abilities. When Eve is three and a half, Marie buys her a grand piano and hires a piano tutor. During Eve's growing years, Marie's letter to her are not comments about polonium's reaction to nickel, but, quote, I think it is unsatisfactory to let all one's interests in life depend on feelings as stormy as the feelings of love, end quote. In later years, Eve pursues journalism. Considering her mother's aversion to journalists, Marie does support Eve's decision. As an aside, Eve's chief complaints of Marie's parenting were wishing that her mother had been more authoritarian so Eve would have had something to rebel against. <laughs> Back to the text. During Eve's teenage years, Marie comes in to chat with her as she is getting ready to go out for a night. Marie, with no desire for makeup, says, I have no objection in principle to this daubing. I can only say one thing to you. I find it frightful. To console myself, I will come kiss you in your bed tomorrow morning before you have time to put these horrors on your face. And now, off you go, my little child. Good night. Oh, do you have anything I can read? Considering, <laughs> considering black is Marie's go-to uh, color choice, it is a shame Eve, Eve's response isn't recorded when Marie tells Eve, get this, Marie tells Eve, you wear black too much. <laughs> Eve has her mother's ability to banter with wry wit. She responds to journalists saying, you see, I am the only one of the family not to have won a Nobel Prize. End quote. And later, Eve's husband, a French diplomat, Henry Labois, Laboisier, he wins a Nobel Prize for the United Nations Children's Emergency Fund in 1965. Now Eve tells a journalist, quote, There were five Nobel Prizes in my family, two for my mother, one for my father, one for my sister and brother-in-law, and one for my husband. Only I was not successful. End quote. Eve leaves the route of playing for piano concerts and instead writes music reviews. She becomes a film and theater critic for Paris magazines using a pseudonym so as not to gain from her famous family name. As Eve moves into her role as a journalist, she interviews dignitaries around the world. Before the U.S. joins in World War II, Eve does use her name and her platform to tour the United States and encourage the U.S. to be a part of the war. Eve meets Eleanor Roosevelt and has dinner at the White House. Eleanor writes, in, writes about Eve in her My Day column. And then Eve giving a lecture in New York City, 19, uh, April 1940, and says, We discovered that peace at any price is no peace at all. We discovered that life at any price has no value whatever. That life is nothing without the privileges, the prides, the rights, the joys that make it worth living and also worth giving. And we also discovered that there is something more hideous, more atrocious than war or than death, and that is to live in fear. End quote. During World War II, Eve joins the French resistance. 
And because she knows German, Eve becomes a special war correspondent, travels to Iran, Ra Iraq, India, China, Burma, and North Africa. Her book, Journey Among Warriors, is published in 1943, and it is nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for correspondence in 1944. Proceeds from book sales are given in support of French prisoners of war. When giving an interview about her strength and courage during World War II, Eve responds, quote, It is the lesson I learned from my mother. End quote. Public opinion will be slow to catch on to encouraging their daughters to be self reliant, as Marie has done with Eve and with Irene. Public opinion will also be slow to acknowledge the dangers of radium. Marie always reminds people that she is not a medical doctor. She and Pierre had accepted the risks associated with radium and they were willing to pay the price for their research. Post-World War I, after millions had been x-rayed, many people who had been exposed to radiation are beginning to suffer from a variety of ailments. In Marie's book, Radiology and the War, she states that radio... I'm sorry, radiodermatitis could lead to death. As a counterbalance, over 8,319 patients, and that was between 1919 and 1935, are cared for at the Radium Institute. Patients are being saved from suffering and death by the use of x-rays and radiation treatments. In 1925, a report recommends that radioactive material be enclosed in a thick, heavy metal box. Workers are to be protected with lead, metal, sorry, with lead screens. Ventilation hoods are in place to remove radioactive gases, and tongs are used to handle radioactive material. Marie insists that her workers have periodic blood tests, although she will rarely follow the protocol herself. Marie's personal friends benefit from radium. Missy undergoes radium treatment, and a tumor is successfully treated. The dancer, Louis Fuller, also has radium therapy for breast cancer and writes Marie, Dear, dear friend, once again in your debt. One reason, is taking, one reason it takes so long to understand the harmful effects of radiation is radioactive material is silent and invisible. If a person gets hit with a bullet, there is a bang and blood. Radiation is different from anything they have ever seen or not seen, before. It affects different people in different ways, and then there is the question of how much radiation is harmful. And yet, staff from Marie's lab are falling ill and they're dying. Marie organizes a fund to raise money for the widows. When Marie is away, Irene writes to Marie about a chemist at the Radium Institute, and she says, in very bad health, she has stomach stomach troubles, and extremely rapid loss of hair, end quote. The chemist has been working with polonium. Marie releases a statement warning research colleagues about the possible dangers affiliated with handling radioactive materials. The time Marie is happiest is in her laboratory, although this joy is now clouded, literally, with her fading vision. She doesn't want workers in the lab to know her eyesight is deteriorating. She tells her daughters, nobody needs to know that I have ruined my eyes, end quote. As Marie struggles with aging and poor health, she writes to Bronya, nor do I know whether even by writing scientific books, I could live without a laboratory. Deeply contemplative for how to spend whatever is left of her life, Marie writes to Bronya, I have suffered so much in my life that I have no more suffering left in me. Only a real catastrophe could affect me now. I've learned what it is to be resigned, and I try to find a few small joys in the grayness of daily life. Tell yourself you can build houses, plant trees, cultivate, cultivate flowers, watch them grow, and not think of anything else. We haven't much life left ahead of us, so why go on tormenting ourselves? End quote. It is the introspection of a tired woman. And that's the end of chapter 11. Thank you.